What is the best case for the resurrection? What are some of the toughest objections against it and responses to it? My guest today, uh, my friend, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, is critical of the minimal facts approach and believes there's another way to better make the case for the resurrection. Now, for this conversation, we're going to use as a launching off a recent conversation I had here with two scholars, Dale Allison and Mike Lacona. Now, obviously, they're not here to defend themselves, so this is just another way of looking at how they approach the resurrection in line with what I try to do on this channel is give a range of different voices. So we're going to use that conversation kind of as a springboard to enter into some of the issues we didn't cover or might cover differently. Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks so much for having me on, Sean. Great to be here. Well, let's just jump right in. Uh, I think much of our audience is going to be familiar with the minimal fakes cast, uh, case for the resurrection. But first, why don't you go ahead and just lay out, here's briefly what it is, contrast that with the maximal case before we get into some of the critique, so to speak. Absolutely. So the minimal facts approach was basically developed and pioneered by Gary Habermas and Michael Lacuna. And the minimal facts approach basically stipulates that uh, certain data data that is incorporated into the case for the resurrection has to meet two criteria in order to be included in that case. One is that it is supported by more than 90% of contemporary scholars across the theological spectrum. And secondly, in their judgment, it has to be well supported evidentially as well. And uh, and one, one of my critiques of the minimal facts approach is that oftentimes there's a base and switch uh, that takes place because the, the group appearances um, are not part of the minimal facts approach and mm -hmm. it certainly uh, or don't meet the minimal facts criteria, I should say. And um, the and, and certainly there isn't a scholarly consensus that would affirm that the experiences of the risen Jesus were anything like those described in the Gospels and Acts. Um, and so when one pushes back against a minimal, fa a minimal facts theorist, by postulating some sort of objective vision experience or some sort of hallucinatory uh, experience, then it's typical to respond to that by uh, appealing to the implausibility of group or shared hallucinations or, mm. or objective visions, etc. But that, but that is to then um, bring in data points that are not affirmed by that overwhelming scholarly consensus. And um, oftentimes you'll find minimal facts uh, theorists will uh, build a lot of their case and rest a lot of their case on the, the Pauline corpus in particular, um, rather than the Gospels and the Acts, um, especially texts like 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, which lists uh, various appearances of Jesus after his death to Peter, to the 12, uh, to the, uh, the other apostles, James, the brother of Jesus, and the 500. And last of all, of course, did Paul himself. Um, and it's often argued that that predates, it predates Paul's own composition and it's a pre-Pauline oral creedal tradition that he likely received from the apostles themselves. The, the problem, though, is that on the basis of 1 Corinthians 15 and the Pauline corpus uh, more broadly, it's very difficult to say with confidence anything about what the alleged experiences were purportedly like. And if we're not able to say what the alleged experiences were supposedly like, it becomes very difficult to say with confidence that the apostles were rational in, in affirming that Jesus was raised bodily from the dead. So the approach that I take, by contrast, is what's called the maximal data approach, which basically, are, basically asserts up front that the Gospels and Acts actually do reflect the unembellished testimony of those who are purportedly eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, and of course is prepared to argue for that fact. And that being the case, then basically there's three alt um, possible explanations for the appearances that are on the table, okay. um, or for the claim. Uh, one is that they were honestly mistaken. One is mm -hmm. that they were lying about it, or one is that Jesus in fact did rise from the dead. And if and, and the maximal data approach will argue that number one, it's immensely implausible they were honestly mistaken because of the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters. They involve not just uh, individual sightings from a great distance and very briefly, or something like that, but rather they involve in group sightings, group conversations with Jesus, physical contact with Jesus, eating with Jesus on more than one occasion, as extended across a 40 day time period and so forth. Um, it's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about that. And then there's a context of persecution where the original apostles were willing to voluntarily undergo and endure sufferings and hardships and persecutions, imprisonments, in some cases, martyrdom on account right. of their testimony that Christ was raised from the dead. And so multi-party okay. conspiracies for a libertarian state tend to break down. So that supports, I think, the, the resurrection claim. So 
it seems like in some ways there are strengths and weaknesses of both. And obviously you think the strengths outweigh in the maximal data case. So I've heard Lacona in a debate with Ehrman. Ehrman's raising contradictions and Lacona goes, that's not my case. You're critiquing something over there. I don't have to deal with a claim of contradictions because I'm advancing certain historical truths that we can know independently of a larger case for the Gospels. Now, if you're taking a maximal data approach, then you have to deal with things like contradictions. So without going into too much depth, you don't see that as a significant downside. How would you approach an objection like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think I, I consider it a, a privilege rather than a burden to offer a defense of the robust reliability mm. of the Gospels and Acts. I think that the vast majority of the supposed discrepancies, contradictions between the Gospel accounts or between Acts and the letters of Paul are very, very weak. Uh, there is a small handful of supposed discrepancies that are interesting and, and need some work to, to unpack. But the vast majority of them have vaporized under close inspection or have very, very plausible harmonizations. Um, so, um, and, and I think okay. that the, there's also, of course, a positive case for the reliability of the Gospels and Acts as well. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that. I think that's fair. Would you make any distinction? Because you mentioned that Gary Habermas came up with the middle facts approach. I think if I remember correctly, 1979, Michigan State in an academic setting defending the resurrection and got it cleared in a you know public university versus a popular level case. So when I teach my class on the resurrection of Biola, a number of students will say, I can see the value on an academic level approaching it this way, but on a more popular level, they'll take a different approach. What do you think about that? Yeah, so you, often this, or this uh, objection is expressed um, by pointing out that the maximal data approach takes too long to say and people lose interest, whereas the maximal data approach is, is clean, it's quick, and uh, and so it's, it's advantageous to present a minimal facts approach. And my response, though, would be to point out that if we're right in our critique of the minimal facts approach, then we don't have a choice but to use a hmm. maximal data approach because our argument is that the minimal facts approach is insufficient uh, epistemologically to justify robust confidence in the resurrection of Jesus. And so we have to use a maximal data approach. And then I would also argue that you can provide a condensed summation of the maximal data approach in the way that I just did previously. You know, I didn't give you a two hour lecture on the reliability of the gospel of the next. <laughs> I give you a, a succinct summary. And if you want justification of the premises, I'm happy to to go on for um, for at length on that. Okay, super helpful. Uh, those of you, I see some comments come in, and we're going to come to your questions at the end. Think of your toughest questions on the resurrection and write question in caps, and we will work through some of those as we get to the end. But let's jump into some of the evidence. And a lot of this evidence was discussed between Allison and between Lacona in that recent dialogue. I'd love to hear your take on it. They talked about the value or lack thereof in the appearance of the 500. So one of the things that Allison will point out that a lot of people do is we don't know where it happened. We don't know when it happened. Uh, we don't know a name of anybody within this 500. There's no additional corroboration for it. Yeah, it's written within 25 years, but a long ways away from where it likely happened. Historically, minimal value. What's your take? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the weaknesses of the minimal facts case that, yeah, there are there's the appearance of the 500 in 1 Corinthians 15, which is a grip experience. And there's also another grip experience in 1 Corinthians 15, namely the appearance to the, tw to the, to the, to the 12. But it gives us new information about what those experiences were supposed to have been like. And Dale Allison, of course, in the book uh, on, on the resurrection, contains a whole chapter on, uh, suppose, uh, on, a, on Marian apparitions with a case study of, of one. And, uh, and of course, uh, if, if you can't say what the resurrection experiences were like, as I said before, it's, it's very difficult to adjudicate the rationality of of that claim and uh, of, or the conclusion of having uh, witnessed the resurrected Christ. And so I, I do think that the appearance of the 500 in verse Corinthians 15 carries some evidential value, but I do think it's a major line of argument. I, I tend to think, and this is speculation on my part, that the appearance of the 500 is quite plausibly the same event as described in Matthew 28 in Galilee, which seems to have been a meeting with prior appointment. Uh, and of course, Matthew 28 mentions that some doubted, which suggests that there were more present than the 12 who had already had an encounter with the risen Jesus. Um, so that, that's my speculation. But I, I, I do think the appearance of the 500 is a major line of argument in the case for the resurrection. Okay, I appreciate that you admit that's a matter of speculation. We don't know. We're trying to piece it together. But in your case, it's one piece of a larger cumulative case for the resurrection. 
wouldn't throw it out, but wouldn't start there with your case either. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, one of the suggestions uh, that's been made is that Mark has less historic value mm -hmm. because it doesn't have some of the same supernatural elements we see in later Gospels. It doesn't have an appearance of Jesus, only a report about a pending appearance of Jesus. So would you accept that premise, given that you have a maximal value one and move from Mark to the other Gospels to make your case? Yeah, so I, I think that... Um, so. so Alison in, in the debate mentioned that Mark is the least apologetically helpful. And um, it's often pointed out that Matthew and Luke have more details regarding the resurrection appearances than Mark does. And of course, John is the most detailed of all. And so you've got this supposed uh, development uh, from um, very few details to many details in the latest of the Gospels. And one point I'd make there is, is a number of points that, that bear on this. Um, first of all, the argument, in my judgment, for the reliability of John and Luke undercut the idea that they were including uh, made up stories as part of a um, development or, or embellishment. Uh, and we have reason to believe from, from their access to witnesses, and in John's case, being one of the witnesses, um, and from their care that they weren't just uh, including made up stuff, much less making up stuff themselves. Um, and furthermore, we don't know, I mean, Mark, of course, as you know, terminates in at the end of verse eight, uh, the mm -hmm. long enigma Mark from verse nine onwards is a later addition, which, uh, almost all textual critics would affirm sure. that being the case, we don't know how, how Mark uh, would have finished it had he included an actual narrative of the resurrection appearances. Um, and of course, scholars debate as to whether Mark actually intended to finish at verse eight or whether versus, um, whether there was an original ending that, that subsequently been lost. Now, so, um, it's, but, so then uh, the question is, okay, so the, now we're, we're down to three gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, and Matthew and Luke, seem to have been written around the same time. It doesn't seem that one is literally dependent upon the other. Um, and, uh, and so that leaves you with essentially two data points. You've got Matthew and Luke being less detailed than John, and that's not a very robust um, foundation for an argument. Um, now, in terms of marks of independence between Matthew and Luke, that suggests that, there, that it's not that Luke is simply taking Matthew's account and adding details. Um, for one thing, the very fact that Matthew describes only a meeting in Galilee between Jesus and the, the male disciples, uh, while Luke describes only a meeting in Jerusalem between Jesus and the 11 and those who are with them, shows the independence of, the, of their mm. accounts. Now, some, some scholars, of course, try to deny that by saying that Luke is redacting or inventing, uh, presumably either um, Mark, where an angel urges the woman to tell the disciples that Jesus is going uh, ahead into Galilee, or perhaps uh, Matthew or, or the Q document or what have you and hence inventing a meeting between Jesus and the disciples in Jerusalem. Um, but I, I do think that that's a, a necessary move. I think that the simpler explanation is that these are just independent accounts. They're coming from independent streams of, of, of tradition. Um, and so I, I think since these are independent, I don't think that Luke is embellishing upon Matthew. So really the only interesting data point, again, is that John is more detailed than Matthew and Luke, which is not a very compelling basis for the argument. So a couple of things. Number one, you'd say the amount of legendary development is less than people assume that it is. So there's an earthquake, there's two angels, there's the dead rising, which are clearly supernatural elements that arise later in Matthew. But when you look at the story as a whole, you've still got a resurrection, you've still got angels. That development is arguably less than people would say. Uh, but second, when it comes to the criterion of multiple attestation, People will often say Matthew, Mark, and Luke count as one because they're relying on a common source. John may be a second. Sounds like you would reject that approach and say, even though they borrow some of the material from Mark, they're still independent, reliable witnesses that give us a larger cumulative case. Is that fair? That is correct. Uh, in that particular case, I was I was saying that Luke is independent of Matthew, which is generally agreed upon. Though there, uh, though okay. it's often thought that Matthew and Luke may be drawing upon a common source or Q. But uh, right. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly think that even though there's a synoptic problem where the synoptic gospels are literally dependent upon one another in, in some fashion, and that's of course known as a synoptic problem in New Testament scholarship. Mm -hmm. Uh, there also seems to be evidence of independent access to the events as well. Um, and uh, I, I think the resurrection narratives and, and indeed the passion narratives is one example where there is very definite independent access to, to, to these events. And as you rightly said, Matthew, of course, contains the, the rising of the saints in Matthew 28 uh, at, at Jesus' crucifixion, which is not found in Luke. So there's an example where, right. uh, where you've got the reverse happening. 
and the guards that are not found in Luke as well. So there's a lot right, of independent exactly. material. Okay, we're going to come back to your case for the Gospels themselves as a part of your maximal data approach. But let's talk about the appearance in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, this is a piece of your larger case. For the minimal facts argument, this is the heart of the case because it's creedal, because it's early, it comes from Paul, it's accepted. And of course, the Apostle Paul, after listing the appearances to Peter, the 12, James, and the 500, lists the appearances to himself. First off, I'm curious, do you think Paul's appearance is visionary? And in what sense would it be visionary? How do you take Paul's appearance in comparison with the others there? Well, it was certainly vision-like uh, in the sense that the, the the traveling companions who were present with Paul on the road to Damascus didn't see any, anyone. And of course, with a vision-like experience, you couldn't take a photograph of it, right? In the same way that you could if Jesus, um, if Jesus physically rose and appeared to someone, then you could take a picture of it because it was actually there was actually a tangible presence that that's not there with a, a vision-like experience. So I, I think that um, Paul's experience is nonetheless veridical, though. Um, it's often pointed out that uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 adds his own appearance in, in verse 8 to the other appearances. And since Paul's appearance seems to have been vision-like, then on what basis do we say that the other uh, apostles did not have similar vision-like experiences? Um, and that would, of course, be Dale Allison's interpretation of the resurrection encounters, that they were vision-like experiences rather than physical encounters with the risen Jesus. And there's a number of things that, that one can uh, say there. Um, so, um, so for example, uh, Kirk McGregor, uh, who's a scholar, notes, and I'm quoting, he says, the, um, this observation, so he's, he's talking about um, the, um, um, uh, so in um, Paul's statement, um, eschaton de um, panton uh, es, esperé to ekremati um, ofi kamu, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he was seen also by me. Mm. Um, so this, it may be argued, draws a separation between uh, his, uh, his experience from that of the other apostles that were before him. So Kirk McGregor notes on that, and I quote, this observation rules out the possibility that Paul is here attempting to convey that he experienced Christ in a manner qualitatively identical to those listed in the Crete. Uh, um, but Paul moves a, st a step further by placing he was seen also by me after um, 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 Paul explicitly shows um, that to be a um, to be a qualifying phrase, uh, which modifies opte kamu rather than a temporal indicator. Hence, Paul uses ospere to ekromati to explain how the character of his experience of his appearance was likely qualitatively distinct from those recounted by the primitive tradition. Uh, while the previous disciples saw Jesus in the normal fashion, Paul admits to have, as to one untimely born, seen Jesus, namely to have seen him in an abnormal fashion. And mm -hmm. I think that that evidence is, is uh, surely uh, suggestive, but it doesn't seem to me to be conclusive. Um, he might simply be indicating that uh, Paul might simply be indicating that he had had an encounter with the risen Jesus uh, with the risen Lord, despite the fact that Paul had not known Jesus during his earthly ministry. So I think that's also a possible interpretation. But I think that the most decisive way of um, making this argument is to point out that and to argue for it, the proposition that Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And that being the case, and there's an avalanche of evidence that establishes that, then um, then it'd be very surprising if Luke's concept of the nature of the supposed appearances to the apostles were radically different from that of Paul's. Uh, Luke and Paul moved in the same circles. Luke was present with Paul in Acts 21 when Paul meets with the Jerusalem elders. It says all the elders, including James, were present and, and so forth. And um, so I, I, I don't, um, I, I think that that's the, the best way of making that argument. And of course, um, um, the minimal facts approach uh, doesn't, really appeal to acts in making that case because it's that's not part of the minimal it doesn't meet the minimal facts criteria to, to appeal to the big of acts so i think that that's a deficiency in the minimal facts approach that is resolved by taking a more maximal data approach that does appeal to the book of acts and the evidence for luke being a traveling companion of the apostle paul so if we take first corinthians 15 by itself and paul seems to list himself amongst the other kinds of appearances uh, you would say if we stick just in first corinthians 15 itself it gives us not enough information to conclude the kind of appearance that Paul had. That alone is just insufficient. If we expand it to Acts, again, Luke being a traveling companion of Paul who writes Acts and includes his take and his speeches, then we can fill in the gaps of what was meant in 1 Corinthians 15 and have a more robust understanding of it. Is that fair? Exactly. Exactly. 
Okay, exactly so right. mm -hmm. Paul puts himself in 1 Corinthians 15. You got the 12, you got the other apostles, Peter, James, etc., and himself. So he views his appearance as sufficient to be listed as an appearance, qualify as an apostle, but different from the others because you said the people around him would not have videotaped it. So you see this, if I understand correctly, as a supernatural kind of intervention from God, but it was internal for Paul rather than external. Is that fair? That is correct. Not to say that it is not a veridical experience. I think it is, uh, because if, if Acts 9 actually does reflect the testimony of the Apostle Paul, which I would maintain it does, then uh, then it's, it's not the sort of a claim about which it's easy to be honest and mistaken about, especially given that uh, so he not only sees a, a, a blinding light, but he also hears a voice. It introduces himself as Jesus of Nazareth, whom he's been persecuting, and uh, commissions him to the role of apostle, and so forth. And um, and he's also blinded by the experience, uh, and uh, he's healed later by uh, Ananias, and and, and so it, and, and it, it seems to be veridical uh, in that respect, but not as strongly veridical as the experience of the other apostles of which we read in the gospel accounts. Okay, that's that. That's super helpful. Uh, I, I'm curious as I think about this, if you're given a public defense to like a group of high school students or a church and they say, hey, Dr. McClatchy, speak on the resurrection. You got 45 minutes. Don't give me your talk, but give me your quick summation of how you would make a case for someone who doesn't understand these nuances because obviously the minimal facts approach is going to say, we know Jesus died, uh, buried, maybe that probably is including middle facts, but died, there's certain appearances, uh, the empty tomb doesn't fit within it, but these the appearance to Paul, etc. Lay out those minimal facts. What would yours look like in that kind of audience? Yeah, so... I, I would present uh, the argument much like I did previously, which is to say that uh, the Gospels and Acts actually do reflect the unembellished testimony of those who were purportedly eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. That, and that being the case, and of course, I'm prepared to justify that if questioned, uh, then uh, the the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters are difficult to explain on the hypothesis that the apostles were honest and mistaken because they involve you know, group conversations with Jesus, long discourses like the Emmaus disciples, for example, in Luke 24. They involve eating with Jesus on more than one occasion. Luke 24, Jesus is brought fish in their presence. In John 21, Jesus makes mm -hmm. breakfast for them on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it involves physical contact, like Jesus invites Thomas to touch him in the Gospel of John. Um, you have physical contact in, in Luke. Uh, and according to Acts 1, it's like course of 40 day time period, so it's not a brief and confusing episode. You might also point out, of course, uh, that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul introduced, Paul um, states that Christ is the fulfillment of the first fruits feast. He's the first fruits from among those who have fallen asleep. And of course, that, uh, that uh, echoes uh, Leviticus 23, which introduces the feasts of Israel, one of which is the first fruits feast which is, according to Leviticus 23, to be celebrated the day following the first Sabbath, following the Passover, which lands you on the Sunday, which, of course, is the day, according to all four Gospels, that Christ was raised from the dead. And there's no competing tradition with that. There's no tradition that competes with that. And then also the early church fathers um, maintained that the they were to gather together to worship on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, uh, very, very consistently. There's no deviation from that. And you find that even in the New Testament, in Revelation, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He doesn't take time out to explain what the Lord's Day is. And um, Paul talks about gathering a collection uh, on, the, on the first day of the week. Um, in the book of Acts, also, um, the 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 Christians meet to break bread on the first day of the week on the Lord's Day. And so, um, that's that uh, correlation between the Feast of First Fruits and Christ's resurrection. It po points towards design because of the theological import. A Christ, just as the first fruits of the harvest was the guarantor, the rest of the harvest was to come. So, likewise, Christ is the guarantor of the general resurrection at the end of the world. Um, he's the first fruits of the resurrection, and so because of the theological import of that, that's a really striking match that is again points away from the hypothesis of being honest and mistaken and in favor of the hypothesis of the resurrection. And, and then that leaves us with two remaining contending hypotheses, namely Jesus did rise from the dead or the apostles lied. And I think that the willingness of the apostles to suffer uh, imprisonments and hardships and dangers and even martyrdom on account of the resurrection goes a long way towards, towards establishing that. You can also bring in, and I was glad to see that um, 
Dale Allison acknowledged this point. Also, the testimony of a wom the woman in all four Gospels, uh, which seem to be independent accounts, by the way, the, the Gospels seem to use women uh, as the chief discoveries of the empty tomb independently of one another. And given the, uh, the patriarchal society of ancient Israel, where the testimony of a woman is not highly esteemed, it's worth a fraction of that, the male witness, the, um, the, um, uh, it seems unlikely that they would have made that up uh, intentionally. Um, I just want to address okay. real quickly. Um, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, and then we'll come back to that. I think the challenge for the maximal data approach is to make it memorable to people, understandable, and to make it sink home. Because that was a lot of information. I know students and I know people in the church audience are going to feel like, if you just give me four facts and why the resurrection explains it, that's a lot easier to memorize and grasp. So I'm not saying anything within the case you said is false, but that's a challenge to try to say, how do we get people to understand this and grasp this? That's a little bit of an additional challenge, but well, not I, to I the case that, itself. I, I think we can present it though as a trilemma argument where the apostles were honestly mistaken or they were lying or they were telling the truth. I mean, these are the three contending explanations for any testimonial claim, whether we're talking about a sexual assault allegation or witness to a miracle, whatever it happens to be. And if we can show that it, they weren't honestly mistaken and they weren't lying, the best or most probable explanation is that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. So there, there's- Okay, let me jump in. That, that, that's exactly the way it needs to be framed. Three options, mm -hmm. compare it to a trial. Here's how we normally reason weed him out, come to the conclusion, then people are going to say, I get it. That's what I was kind of looking for in terms of how to frame it. That makes sense. Now, you were going to respond to something earlier. Go ahead before we keep I, moving on. Sure. I, I just wanted to uh, clarify a, a misconception about the maximal data approach that I actually found in Dale Allison's book. Um, on page 714, he actually briefly alludes to the maximal data approach. He says, because he, uh, the maximal data approach, of course, was pioneered and developed by Tim and Lydia McGrew. Um, and he said, he's quoting from, or he's alluding to uh, the Black Hole Companion to Natural Theology chapter that the McGrews co-authored. And he says, as for the McGrews, they presume the detailed facticity of Luke 24, 36 through 43, where the risen Jesus eats fish, and in John 20, 24 through 29, where Jesus shows himself to doubting Thomas. Narratives of historicity, many, including everyone who disbelieves in the resurrection of Jesus, query. And of course, this is um, alleging a circular argument on the McGrew's part, where they're assuming what they're trying to prove, the conclusions hidden in the premises. And of course, this is this is not what the McGrews are trying to do in the Black Hole Companion chapter. Rather, they, uh, they are arguing that the account in Luke 24, 36 to 43, and John 20, 24 through 29, and other resurrection texts, reflect the unembellished testimony of, of, of the original apostles. They reflect what the original apostles were saying about the resurrection. And so then we try to give an account for why they're making that claim. So we're not assuming the detailed facticity. That's the conclusion of the argument, not the premise. Gotcha. That's, that's helpful. I appreciate you bringing that in. Now, I've been anxious to get your thoughts on this idea in uh, Dale Allison's book I had never heard of until I read it and was like, wow, rainbow bodies this is so interesting now one of the things i think allison does is he pushes back on he, he's calling for a sense of consistency as he sees it that apologists make this case are we being consistent with other evidence for other religions and miracles or dismissing them and so he points to these rainbow bodies as a way of saying ah there's comparable evidence for this supernatural feat uh how should we approach that if we're going to be consistent. Now, you've thought about this. I think you've done some critique on it. I'd love to hear what you think. First off, explain what is meant by a rainbow body and then give your uh, criticism of it. Sure. So uh, this is in chapter 12 of D. Allison's book. And the claim is that there have been Buddhist uh, masters whose bodies have physically vanished following their death, sometimes uh, leaving behind their, nail, uh, their nails, uh, their hair or a robe, uh, sometimes leaving nothing behind but the robe, um, and sometimes even shrinking to smaller size over time. And a rainbow is seen over the place where the body lay. And, uh, um, and so Allison, as I said, devotes chapter 12 of his book to what he purports to be parallels between this phenomenon and the Christian claim of resurrection. And um, this, is, this is a species of what uh, we call a trial by proxy fallacy, where Instead of taking seriously the evidence for Christianity, one talks about you know, something else, uh, saying, look at how evidence, uh, uh, look how weak the evidence for this other thing is. And so the evidence for Christianity 
uh, is weak as well. Um, and I think that what Allison is doing is, is a cousin of this. So he implies that you have to, in order to be consistent, accept both or neither of those. And if you fail to link them in that way, then you're, you're being prejudiced in favor of your Christian uh, beliefs. So in, um, in his book, he says, um, and I'm quoting, he says, um, what would follow if every single one of the stories from Tibet is a hagiographical fabrication or the product of pious hocus pocus? A Christian wanting to defend the uniqueness of Jesus' resurrection might think this the obvious way to back. Yet to my mind, the apologist should here be ill at ease. Would not rejection of all the non-Christian stories reinforce the skeptic's repeated insistence that religious sincerity and eyewitness testimony do not ensure the historical truth? Um, and of course, that 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 depends. Is there any uh, maximal data apologist worth his salt is going to point out? Um, I mean, of course, religious sincerity and eyewitness testimony don't ensure historical truth. Uh, we have to look at the particulars of the case. Um, he says, um, and I quote, if Tibetan bodies never mysteriously dissipate in a few days, but rather against the multiple testimonies, some of it indisputably firsthand, invariably succumb to the usual phases of biological decay, then some must be, if not liars, then deluded victims of someone's misperception or trickery. And truly, the more examples of such delusion and or deceit surrounding dead bodies that one can amass, the more confident skeptics will be in rejecting the testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so he's basically trying to argue that both have to stand or fall together. Okay. And um, I, I, I don't think that when you actually look at the particulars of the case that pertain to these uh, Tibetan claims of rainbow bodies, that the argument is all that uh, convincing at all. So for okay, example- Okay, let, let, um, let me jump in really fast. Before you get to the course. critique, in principle, would you, I assume you'd agree with him, that we need to be consistent in our methodology we cannot approach resurrection appearances and supernatural in the Bible and give that a pass in a way we don't to other religions. So his call for consistency is good. We need to pay attention to this, research these with an open mind. But when you research them, look at them, that's where you think the case falls apart. Is that fair how you look at this? Exactly. Yeah. So okay. I, I do think that the parallels are as strong as Allison thinks they are. Okay. Um, so... So, I, I, um, I, as maximal data apologists, we're not uh, we're, we're not inferring that the resurrection took place on the basis of ideological prejudice. Rather, we consider the counter hypothesis. We hypotheses. We consider hypotheses like the tomb theft hypothesis and the mm -hmm. objective vision hypothesis and so forth. Um, and uh, I think one point of contrast between the so, so these uh, rainbow body, the rainbow body phenomenon, and the resurrection is the apostles' multisensory experience uh, and the context of persecution uh, that we find, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so, so how difficult would it be to be honestly mistaken? Remember the trilemma? They're either correct or they're honestly mistaken or they're lying. Now, how easy would it be to be mistaken? Well, here's a quote from Allison. He says, there is, in any case, no doubt that the Dalai Lama is a man of upright character who believes that Akhok's body disappeared. He furthermore knows firsthand some of the witnesses involved, witnesses who handle handed him physical evidence related to the alleged event. Now, what is that alleged physical evidence? Well, he tells us on the same page. He says, and I quote, one day in 1998, according to the Dalai Lama, Ikhok surprised his disciples by announcing that he would leave. He put on his saffron robe and told them to seal him inside his room for a week. His disciples followed his request and after a week opened the room to find that he had completely disappeared except for his robe. One of his disciples and a fellow practitioner came to um, Dharamsala, where they related the story to me and gave me a piece of his robe. Now, hmm. he gave me a piece of his robe. I mean, that's of no evidential vector whatsoever. Um, I mean, uh, Lydia McGrew, who has critiqued this argument, by the way, in two videos on her YouTube channel, which I highly recommend, hmm. compared it to uh, postulating that her husband, Tim, flew around the room one day and then someone asks her for evidence of this and she supplies the shoe in which he flew around the room. Well, of course, that, that's of no evidential vector whatsoever. Hmm. Even, uh, and we don't even know for sure that it was, in fact, the, the guy's robe. And even, even if it was, I don't think it's particularly significant. Now, what about the shrinking corpse? Well, here's um, another quote. He, he quotes from Francis Tiso's book on this subject. Um, and it says, Francis Tiso was able to interview three people, all Tibetan monks, who were on the scene in the days after Kempo A. Cho died. They agreed on the essential facts, which they claimed to behold for themselves. Each day, the object under a yellow robe or cloak, presumed to be Kempo A. Cho's corpse, known as presumed to be Kempo A. Cho's corpse, became smaller and smaller until finally, on the eighth day, nothing was there at all. 
One of these monks also told Tiso that thereafter the post mortem Kenpo appeared to many of his disciples. Um, now, this reminds me a little bit of the origins of Mormonism, where uh, Joseph Smith permitted the witnesses to see mm. the golden place you know, under a cloth. Uh, and of course, these witnesses are seeing this body apparently shrinking underneath um, a robe um, or a cloak. And so, uh, I mean, it's, um, it's not clear that, uh, that it continued to be the body that was under the robe. Perhaps someone replaced it with a, with a smaller object and so forth. We need more details to, to evaluate the rationality of those onlookers that the body was, in fact, getting smaller. Um, another important difference is that it's not establishing a new idea like the disciples of Jesus were. So there's a good book uh, from the 1700s by a guy called John Douglas called The Criterion, where he lays out criteria to evaluate uh, miracle claims. And one of the criteria that he puts forward is um, that uh, it might have been allowed to pass without examination because it, it confirms ideas already established. So he argues uh, that it's much easier to support an existing religion by uh, allegation of miracles within the religious context than it is to establish a new set of religious ideas within a hostile context by an allegation of a miracle. Uh, there's no context of persecution or danger for, in, in this case, for the people who are actually making the claim uh, of the of these uh, rainbow bodies. Um, so ha so it's, it's difficult for us to be confident that they're not lying. In fact, there, there can be embellishments made to stories. So there's some important points of contrast. And of course, it would be much weaker, a much weaker case for the resurrection if we only had the empty tomb and we didn't have the, uh, the appearances as well. Sure. Um, uh, finally, um, so um, when we actually go to Francis Tiso's book, which is titled uh, Rainbow Bodies and Resurrection, he, uh, and he interviews various people concerning one particular case. Uh, he never suggests any kind of fraud in the book. He doesn't ask questions uh, that seem to be examining the opportunities for fraud. Uh, he doesn't ask what opportunities there could have been for someone to take the, the, the body of Kempo away and bury it without others knowing. He doesn't ask if anyone would have the opportunity to replace the body with some other objects. And then there's um, a really um, telling quote concerning the rainbow um, that's supposed to appear over the place where the body's been laid. And he says, and I quote, during this interview, Kyug became more confrontational. I was in fact profoundly moved by a statement that he repeated several times. You do not see the rainbow body with the bodily eyes, but with the eyes of the heart. As he spoke, mm. Lama Kyug frequently emphasized the contrast between bodily eyes and the eyes of the heart. Right. So <laughs> that's a pretty telling quotation as well. That is really similar to the case with Mormonism that what does it mean to be a witness listed at the beginning of the Book of Mormon? Well, did they actually see it? Did they actually touch it? When you probe down into the details, on the surface, it sounds like you have witnesses for Christianity, witnesses for Mormonism. You probe, and there's family members. There's people who recant. They don't actually physically see it. Breaks down. Seems like you're saying the same with rainbow bodies. Lydia McGrew is joining us, and she said, I gave the one minute and a 10 minute in a video on my YouTube channel. I assume if you just search Lydia McGrew, it'll come up on the YouTube channel. And I've given a 35 minute version on a publicly available video for the Oropagus uh, Forum. I can provide the links here. Please provide the links if you don't mind, Lydia. That would be great. I think we have a doctoral dissertation in the making of somebody going to offer a very in-depth analysis of rainbow bodies I think would be helpful. So I, I appreciate Del Allison bringing this kind of charge. Ultimately, in my experience, we have these kind of objections. They seem to have some force. But when we probe into the details, for example, these things bubble to the surface, like the context of an unexpected resurrection within time, you proclaim it costs you something. And like Michael Kona pointed out, skeptics who see the risen Jesus is qualitatively different, different than those four rainbow bodies. Um, let's talk about a topic you mentioned earlier, and Dale and uh, Mike got into this a little bit. So really, I want to know what you think is this comes up a lot the reported apparitions of mary and the supposed parallel between those and the appearances of jesus what's your take on that and then for those watching we're going to come to some questions at the end we're definitely going to have some time excellent well this is in chapter 14 of the Allison's book where he brings up a particular case study of an apparition of mary uh, called uh, the, the appearance in, in Zetun. 
um, which is um, a mass um, apparition, apparently, of Mary that was reported to have occurred in the Zetun district of Cairo, Egypt, um, during a period of approximately three years, uh, beginning in 1968. And uh, Dale Allison in the book mentions that the first apparition of Mary at Zetun was recorded in 1968, and the phenomenon was seen by two mu Muslim bus mechanics. Of course, Mary is revered in Islam as well. And they claimed to, to witness a woman that was dressed in white on the roof of St. Mary's Coptic Church. And uh, one actually thought she was a nun uh, who was about to mm. attempt suicide by leaving from the roof. And so she uh, they, they called the police. And uh, the um, a, a crowd gathered at the site when they heard the mechanics yelling, don't jump. And the police attempted to disperse them. And um, told them that the sighting was just a reflection of the light from the street lamps. Um, and um, later, um, a church custodian suggested that the figure was the Virgin Mary. And then Mary showed up for a period of uh, about three years thereafter on various occasions, even sometimes multiple times in a week. So, um, so let me just give you a, a couple of quotations from... Um, let me give you a quotation from Dale Allison. This is from um, his book uh, regarding the Zetun apparitions of Mary. He says, and I quote, the first ob observers did not initially take the figure to be Mary. So that's an important point. The two mechanics rather thought they were looking mm. at a nun or a girl. And at no time did the figure as a tune, which never spoke and left the impression of an animated statue interpret itself. So very, very um, big contrast between this apparition and the appearances of Jesus, which involve, as I said before, conver group conversations, physical contact. He does actually introduce himself as Jesus um, and so forth. Very, very different um, situation. Hmm. Um, there's also, as I mentioned earlier, um, the fact that this is um, confirming of beliefs already established. Uh, and I mentioned John Douglas's criteria. Um, and um, he, um, so um, in, in the book, Allison says, what prompted the identification of the luminous form with Mary and then the far-flung acceptance of this interpretation, Mary was already firmly associated with Zetun. Um, and he quotes uh, um, a witness, um, Cynthia Nelson, who is a social scientist who was teaching in Cairo. Uh, he came away without religious convictions. And it seems to me very clear there's some, obviously some sort of auto-suggestion going on here. So this, here's the quote. When I looked to where the crowds were pointing, I too thought I saw a light. As I tried to picture a nun-like figure, I could trace the outlines of a figure. But as I thought to myself that this is just an illusion, the image of the nun would leave my field of vision. Hmm. Um, so it seems to me there's some sort of auto-suggestion going on there. And uh, I, 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 um, the, the reported apparitions of Mary, including in this case, are very clearly a far cry from what the witnesses claimed in the case of the resurrection. Uh, and hence, they're a far cry from what they were rational in believing uh, if they really experienced what they said they did. Um, and I, I do think that we as Christians need to feel any sense of obligation to offer a convincing explanation of these supposed parallels. Uh, it seems to me that what Allison is trying to do here is, is to bury us with these parallels that he wants to draw. And so we end up essentially in, in the same, place, same position as him with a fuzzy feeling that something odd is happening in all these cases, mm. including the resurrection, but we can't rationally distinguish the objective evidence between the resurrection and these, and these other oddities. Now, I can't give you a full account of what happened at Zetun or other Marian apparitions necessarily, but I, I don't think that the comparison to the resurrection of Jesus is sufficiently strong for it to really make us lose sleep. Oh, that's fair. So it, it sounds like your methodology just differs from Allison's methodology in terms of even approaching parallels in Marian accounts, the resurrection, rainbow bodies, and the resurrection. A lot of these differences come down to just a difference in assumptions and methodology approaching these kinds of questions, and they flush themselves out in the particular. So that, that's one of the things I really emphasize in my class, again, on the resurrection, is we read Lacona's book, and then we read N.T. Wright's book. We also read some critical material as, as well at times, but I have them pay close attention to methodology. And so that's when we come to the resurrection, all of us have certain assumptions, and it's going to shape the way we're going to look at the data. Habermas has said he thinks the biggest objection to the resurrection is not a particular theory, but it's rejection of the supernatural and the possibility of miracles. It's on a worldview level.
Now, you disagree with the minimal facts. Would you agree with that point? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Good, quick Twitter answer. So I've got one more question for you, and then we'll go to questions. So those of you, uh, Christian, skeptic, whatever, uh, Muslim, uh, write in, write as question uh, in caps so we can see it. We'll pull them in. Maybe, and it's going to have to be somewhat brief, maybe just lay out for us how you would make a case for the Gospels. Like maybe just two or three points you would advance without all the details here. Maybe we'll have you come back and talk about this. I know Lydia McGrew is doing some great work in this area. When you talk about the Gospels reliability as a whole, a part of this maximal case, what are some of the key points you would advance uh, to do so? Sure. So there are multiple categories of evidence that bear positively on the reliability of the Gospels and Acts. Uh, I can just give you a sampling here. So one uh, category would be undesigned coincidences in the Gospels and Acts. Okay. So, um, for example, if we look at um, Mark chapter 6, verse 31, we read that uh, the, uh, this is set up for the feeding of the 5,000 miracle, and um, there is crowds are coming and going, so the disciples can't find leisure even to eat. So he has, has them come away to a deserted area to eat. And unfortunately for them, the crowds follow, and Jesus has them sit down in groups on the green grass in verse 39. And this raises two interesting questions. What about the coming and going crowds? What's with that? And also the, the grass in Israel is not green. It's brown throughout the majority of the year, except at a relatively narrow window of time during the spring because of the higher levels of rainfall, and which coincides with the Jewish feast of Passover. Now, turning over to John 6, verse 4, the parallel of feeding the 5,000. John doesn't mention the coming and going crowds, and he also doesn't mention the green grass, but he does mention that the Jewish Passover feast was at hand. And so then that illuminates why there's, it's so busy, because there's all these pilgrims coming in for the feast of Passover, and also illuminates why the grass is green. Um, and But that's never spelled out explicitly for the reader, and John doesn't mention the coming and going crowds of the green grass, whereas uh, uh, Mark doesn't mention the, the time of year the, being Passover. Now, if you look at the next verse in John 6, John 6, 5, we read that Jesus turned to Philip to ask, where do we send the people to buy bread? Now, that raises an interesting question in the mind of the audience. Why does Jesus turn to Philip here in particular? Uh, why not say Judas Iscariot who's turned to the money bag or someone? That Philip's a fairly minor character in the Gospels. Now, if we turn over to John chapter 12, uh, we learn in a very parenthetical remark, I think verse 21, um, that um, Philip is from the town of Bethsaida in Galilee. Um, completely different context removed from John chapter 6. Now, if we go over to Luke chapter 9 in verse 10, which is the parallel of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle, we learn that the, uh, that, we learn that, um, that the event of the feeding of the 5,000 took place in Bethsaida. So then that gives us a complete explanation of why Jesus turns to Philip in John 6, 5. He's okay. a local guy. He knows where the shops are to buy bread. Uh, but that's never explicitly spelled out for the reader. You have to do the detective work of putting these disparate puzzle pieces together. Um, so that's a couple examples. I can give you other examples, or do, do you think you want to go to Q&A at this point? No, no. So so let me jump in. Uh, again, Lynn McGrew has written a whole book on this, Hidden in Plain View. I think I got the title right. In fact, I thought it was so compelling. We included some of that in the updated evidence that demands a verdict. Without defending them, what other points would you advance? Would you advance like archaeological discoveries? Would you say things like embarrassing material? What are just the bullet point areas you would go to to make this larger case for the Gospels? Sure. Uh, so yes, it would include both of those. On archaeological okay. points, I recommend Titus Kennedy's book on the archaeology mm -hmm. of the New Testament, which is an excellent resource on that subject. And Criterion of Embarrassment, yes, I, I do think has evidential value. Um, also, extra-biblical corroborations. Uh, okay. There are cases where there are very incidental allusions in the Gospels that are corroborated in artless and undesigned ways by extra-biblical sources like Josephus, Tacitus, etc. Uh, there are um, um, artless similarities where you have the... Um, characteristics of someone's personality coming through consistently despite diverse throughout diverse episodes across all all four gospels uh, which okay. i think is a compelling argument you can apply that to jesus or peter or, or mary and martha etc um there's uh, unexplained allusions uh, so for instance in mark 15 when jesus is um is carrying his cross and he's no longer able to carry it and they call they, they get a passerby simon of cyrene to coming in from the country to carry it, and that mentions in parentheses that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, who are Alexander and Rufus? Right? They're just name dropped. Like we're, we're supposed to know who they are, um, and clearly they would be they would have been known to the original audience, but they're not known to us. And so that lends the account a sense of verisimilitude. Hmm. Um, that you've got these unexplained allusions that never show up anywhere else in, in the Gospels or Acts. 
Um, so th these would be a, a few examples. There are, there are others as well. Okay, that's helpful. I see some questions here. And uh, one from our friend, uh, Paul Gee. I'm curious to have you respond to this one. This is a great question. Uh, he says, is framing as trilemma instead of quad lemma, including legend, not begging the question or trying to answer? Are the gospels reliable? Or is trilemma a way just for those who are convinced? So should you expand it to include a fourth legend rather than just the three you mentioned? Well, the, the trilemma argument only becomes appropriate once you've shown that the gospels and acts are indeed grounded in eyewitness testimony, that the gospel accounts reflect the unembellished testimony of those who reportedly eyewitnesses of the resurrection. So that provides the foundation of that argument. You could, in principle, expand it to a quadrilemma um, and uh, and then argue for the, the gospel and acts being eyewitness testimony and thus against the legend hypothesis. But um, yeah. Okay. So you narrow it down once you've made a, a an initial case. Right. Uh, all right, looking for questions here. If you write question, uh, there's a lot of comments, which is helpful. Every comment helps. Every thumbs up just helps with the YouTube metrics. But if you have a question, uh, okay, here we go. Here's a good one. Uh, ye of little faith. I love the tagline. Uh, good to see you again. I recognize you. Uh, it says, uh, what would you say to a counter-apologist skeptic such as myself that's open to theism and finds it at least plausible but who finds the evidence for the resurrection unconvincing? Great question. Yeah, I, I would say um, head on over to talk about doubts.com, <laughs> which is, uh, which is uh, my organization that I run where we, we uh, talk to Christians who are struggling with doubts. And we also talk to ex-Christians who have left the faith and want to explore whether there's a rational way back to faith. And we also uh, talk to people who are not Christians and never have been Christians, but are sincerely interested in learning about the evidence for Christianity. So I'd be happy to, to do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with anyone who sincerely wants to talk about the the evidence for Christianity. Um, but I, I'm convinced that when one actually pursues the evidence for Christianity and does so with a fair and open mind, will, at least in the long run, come to find the evidence to be compelling. Mm. That That's that's fair. That's a great response. So on talkaboutdots.com, talkaboutdoubts.com, not talkaboutdots.com. <laughs> uh, let me correct myself on that one. I'm probably sending people your way sometimes daily, a few times a week. You and a range of scholars will Zoom with people personally, hear their doubts, offer your response. Uh, it's one of my favorite ministries because it's helping skeptics who are seeking, Christians who are doubting, and it's a very personal, bottom-up ministry of just helping and engaging people. So if the person's still not convinced, at least they've taken the step to walk through their specific objections. So I would say to our guest, I'd say, write down what your biggest questions are. Why are you not convinced? And then hear someone like Dr. McClatchy give a response and then evaluate it. That's a great tool. I love that you're, you're willing to do this. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Here's another question says, uh, do you think it's a good idea to make an argument for the resurrection based on a conclusion you already reached? Example, the Bible is true, so the resurrection must be true. Well, that, that's not the case. I mean, I am a very staunch evidentialist, so I begin from the ground up. I argue, I don't just assume or presuppose, I'm not a presuppositionalist. I argue that the Gospels and Acts are written by individuals who are close up to the facts, well-informed and habitually scrupulous in the habit of being truthful. And that being the case, then the resurrection narratives that we find in the Gospels and Acts reflect the unembellished testimony of those who are purported by witnesses, and then we can evaluate, okay, what's the best explanation for the claims that have been made in the Gospels and Acts? Okay, good. Now here's some, somewhat of a personal question, but I think this will give you a chance to uh, engage with your take here. Resurrection nerd, by the way, love, love the tagline. Was Jonathan already a Christian before looking at the evidence? I bet he was. So give your personal take to that, but also talk about how you maybe try to minimize bias because I don't know anybody who has worked harder to do this than uh, Mike Lacona in his book on the resurrection, very systematically and very carefully. How do you minimize this and how should we think about bias in the way we approach the evidence? 
But I, I was indeed a Christian before looking at the evidence. I grew up in a Christian home, just as I grew up in a heliocentric believing home and in a dinosaur believing home well before I looked mm. at the evidence for these things. Um, and so my reason now for being a Christian, just as my reason now for being a heliocentrist instead of a geocentrist, is not because that's what my parents told me, but because that's what the public evidence in my judgment suggests very strongly. Um, now, as to how I minimize bias, I... Um, I do try to read as much of the other side as I possibly can. I, I try to uh, read, I, I've read Dale Allison's book. I've read other books um, arguing against uh, the resurrection. I follow Apologia's channel. I, I probably follow more atheist channels than I do Christian channels. And mm. uh, I probably read more atheist books than I re read Christian books. And as I've done that, my confidence in Christianity has grown because I think the evidence is robust and can, can withstand even the best scrutiny. Let me ask you a personal question. We'll come back to this. What do you think is the best scrutiny? What are the toughest challenges? And maybe we covered them today. Maybe we didn't. What are some of the toughest ones that skeptics make? And by the way, in any case, even Jay Werner Wallace has said to me, he said, we have the weight of the evidence, but there's always one or two areas that we're not sure about, but we have to step back and put those in light of the larger case. So there's got to be some areas you're like, I'm not sure what to do with this. Uh, what might those be? You mean in regards to the resurrection in particular or Christianity more broadly? The, the resurrection in particular. Yeah. Um, so I think if I was a skeptic, the, the best, your best bet is to cast doubt on the Gospels and Acts actually being grounded in eyewitness testimony. And of course, Dale okay. Allison does that in his book and other skeptics do that. Um, I don't think that case is successful, but I think that that's your, your best bet. Okay. All right. Fair enough. We got a, got a couple more here. Here's Cade Sharp. Nice to see you back. Recognize you as well. I appreciate your case, Dr. McClatchy, but first, I don't see how this is a clear resurrection case. And second, don't you have to defend all applicable of New Testament? I think he's saying, don't you have to defend the entire New Testament before you make a case for the resurrection as opposed to maybe just the Gospels? No, I, I think that you have you have to defend that the Gospels and Acts actually are based on eyewitness testimony. I don't think you have to defend inerrancy, uh, actually, as it happens, I'm not an inerrantist. Mm. But I think that I, I do consider that to be a high stakes issue, though I do think that there is a high stakes issue in the vicinity, which is the strong reliability of scripture. So there are there are there's a small handful of cases in the Gospels where I think uh, a good case can be made for a minor good faith mistake. And I do, I do draw a distinction between a minor good faith mistake versus deliberate distortion of fact. And I think that the former is of much less grave consequence epistemically than, than the latter. Um, but no, I, do, I don't think that you have to sh show the inerrancy of scripture if that's what you mean. Uh, fair enough. And I would agree with you on that. There's Inerrancy is a second level but important in-house discussion amongst Christians about theology and practical living that is secondary to a case for reliability that can be made for the Gospels as a whole. Uh, there's a handful of other, other questions here, but maybe we'll have you back sometime for just a full Q&A period would be fun to just list the toughest objections and go for it. But where do you see this discussion going? You've been tracking like I have probably for a couple decades. Do you see certain cases coming out that are new? Do you see the case being made stronger? Has it shifted to YouTube and online? What changes do you just see? And this is larger discussion about resurrection and even the evidence for the Christian faith uh, in the time you've done this and maybe even moving forward. In, in popular discourse, I think that the conversation has shifted online, although I think that's an unfortunate thing rather than a good thing, because uh, I think that um, books and, and print are much better mediums for expressing, communicating ideas and details. I think that YouTube is great for uh, giving you kind of the cliff notes or the very basic outline of an sure. argument and uh, getting an introduction. But if you really want to do a deep dive, then you have to go to the literature. And mm. unfortunately, a lot of people are, are going to YouTube, not just as, as a starting point, but as like their, their only uh, point of contact with the, with the data. And so I, I think that that's an unfortunate thing uh, or an unfortunate trend that I, I've seen in my time discussing these topics. That's fair. Hey, let me throw a quick one at you because I think this is a common one people have. And then and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Rock Shumar, I apologize if I mispronounced that. Luke says, simple question. What about the contradictions specifically in the resurrection accounts? For example, how many people, women, angels, were at the tomb? Your take on that specific uh, apparent discrepancy. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks for submitting it. Um, and I'll just state one quickly because we're running low on time, but let's just take the one with the women, uh, how many women were the two on Easter morning. So in, um, so in Mark 16, verse 1, we read, uh, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Matthew 28, verse 1, that after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And Luke 24, 10, it was, it was, no, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman with them who told these things to the apostles. And so according to the synoptics, there are multiple women that go to discover the tomb on Easter morning. And uh, the identity of women between those accounts in the synoptics varies, uh, as Bart Ehrman points out, although that's not particularly important because um, in Luke 24, 10, he's quite explicit that he's not giving this an exhaustive list because he says with the other and the other woman with them. Now, when you go over to John chapter 20, things get more interesting because in verse one, it says, now in the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, if you read verse one in isolation, it looks like Mary is the only one who came. But it gets worse though, because in Matthew 28, verses eight through 10, we read that the other woman, uh, the woman that discovered the tomb on Easter morning, it, with Mary Magdalene present, had had an encounter with the risen Jesus. And so how then do we make sense of John 20, verse 2, where Mary Magdalene goes and reports to the disciples that she doesn't know what's happened to the body of Jesus? So how do we make sense of this? And this is a very common objection to the resurrection narratives. Now, um, we'd, we'd, we'd infer, I think, the conclusion we would be forced to if we suppose that these are indeed historical, uh, reflecting historical memory, is that Mary must have left the group of other women prior to their encounter with the risen Jesus, which is why she doesn't know what's happened to the body of Jesus by the time mm. she reports it to Peter and John. Now, this is actually suggested by a close reading of John 20, verse 2, where it says that she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know, in Greek, uk udamen, use the plural verb, where they have laid him. So Mary's choice of words reveals in passing that there were, in fact, other women. And John's report of these words shows that he knows this. And so it seems that she had, in fact, left a group of other women exactly as you would predict on the hypothesis of historical reporters. And so instead of being an argument against historical reporters, this actually turns out to be an argument for it. That's interesting. I think it's back to a point you made earlier that these differences or apparent discrepancies show that the gospel writers weren't just copying one another and trying to line things up but report things independently. And to show there's not a contradiction, sometimes we don't have all the facts. But one angel and two is not a contradiction. It's a difference. If one says, and they're referring to the same visit at the same time, there was exactly two, and the other one said there's only one, then it seems like you've got a contradiction. Those are not the kind of differences we see with the women and with the angels, as you point out. Uh, Jonathan, super pumped that you came out. Again, uh, I uh, want to highlight as much as I can talkaboutdoubts.com. Great advertising, wearing the hat, by the way. Good job. And you know, I have a link on my website. And if you're a Christian, you have further questions about this, Dr. McClatchy will will Zoom with you personally or his team to talk it through. So share talkaboutdoubts.com. Go there. I think it's great. Also, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other conversations coming up. This is the first time I've mentioned this, but I have an exorcist who's going to come on uh, early next year to talk about that. That's I've talked about demons and angels and supernatural, but never had a conversation with an exorcist. I'm going to have another view on Sodom and Gomorrah from Steve Collins coming on to give that perspective. Have Randy Alcorn coming on to answer the top 16 questions about heaven uh, in a couple weeks. So make sure you subscribe. And also, if you've thought about studying apologetics, we would love to have you at Biola. Uh, We have the top-rated apologetics program. It's fully distanced now, and I have a whole class on the resurrection. We read and discuss and dialogue through this stuff in depth. We'd love to have you. So we appreciate you joining, and we'll see you next time soon. Again, Dr. McClatchy, really appreciate you coming on.